Wait. Um, so you guys, you, how many of you are interested in math and science? How many of you hate it? Okay, that's good. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story about, and that's fine. That's fine. We can still get along. I'm going to tell you a, a quick story. Oh, wait, I've got to get this. About a funny journey that I've been on. Uh, with the help of my company, but sometimes without my company. So what it's called is Lessons from the Colony, or Why You Should Always Carry a Sheet of Plastic. Hopefully I'll get to that sheet of plastic part, but just keep that in mind. So, that clicker thing doesn't work. Ah. Anybody technology person? Okay, so really quickly about me. Uh, as Dario said, I'm an old guy. Any other old guys here? But I've been in IBM for 32 years. 32 years. Not only that, I had the same job for the first 30 years. And I, I got to tell you, I love it. I really do love it. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a very senior in my, my engineering profession. I, I work in the design of chips. Like I worked on chips for, how many of you play video games? Okay, I worked on the chip for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo, Wii. Did any of you, any of you guys have those? I worked on all three of those. But more importantly than that, what is it with this? Ah, I am a nerd. <laughs> Plain and simple. I am just a total, total nerd. And what was really interesting is despite being a nerd, I was actually able, I met a nerdette, uh, 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 IBM, my company issued me a really nice wife. She's really cute. And with, we, you know, it's, it's a scientific principle, I don't know if you understand it, but we were actually able to construct, no, I'll tell you what, you have another, okay, click. Beep! <laughs> Another? Ah, we were able to construct some, some little nerds, nerdettes. <laughs> I don't know if you understand the process involved in that. I don't know what they teach you. But the combination of that, of being a nerd and a dad and not being very good at football, so my kids, I found that they were just as excited if we would go out in the backyard and blow things up that it, that as if we were playing football or something like that. So the funnier looking I got, and I know I'm funny looking. Nature did that. But the funnier looking I got, I started spending lots of time in schools trying to get kids, you know, say, you know, like in middle school, more interested in math and science. It wasn't so much that I wanted them to be like me. God forbid I didn't want them to be like me. But I just love it. It's just like a musician. When you go out and you play music, you don't want everybody to be a musician. You just want them to love it as much as you love it, right? So I started spending a lot of time out there. And that led me to do some pretty crazy things. Like, uh, this is the second craziest thing I've ever done. And I'll eventually get to the first craziest. Ah, Selena? No? I know, but... Ah, 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 stop! Here, back, 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 okay. I, I may have to click on it. Oh, you know what? It doesn't sound like they set it up right. Is it? Please hold. Did you, you have to start it from the directory. You have to put it in the directory. So they probably just copied that file out. Anybody know PowerPoint here? <laughs> hey, let's just use my computer. Can you, uh, nah, nah. So where's the directory? Okay, just go open it from there. Open it from here. Is that where you opened it? No, no, no. You, you copied it. No, you need to put this back in there. That back in there. No, no, yeah, yeah. 
go in here? Ah, si. Si, bueno. Ah, yeah. Ah, cancelado. No lo necesito. Okay, eso. Oh, no, no, okay. This is, uh, como se dice, close the damn thing. Si, sí, bueno. <laughs> ah, perfecto. Ah, no, 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 lo otro. Yep, perfecto. Okay. <sighs> So let's do that. All right, where were we? Uh, okay. As I walk through my business, I know I owe it a debt. It created my profession and my career to show bet. Engineering's my trade and I love my degree. It was that, not my looks, that got my spot on TV. I grew up thinking like my science and math. And you will too if you want to follow my path, school. Now you may be thinking you more gangster than me. But you mother voters never see my DC. If you be a gamer, you can't give me a lift. Cause when you be bragging your homies, you be using my chip. I touch our phone, I know you want those things. It's engineers like me be designing that blame. I don't have I, I don't have statistics for Costa Rica, but I would like some help getting them. But one of the things that really bugged me is this. So this is a chart that shows how many people went into engineering, math, and science careers from about the time I was born to a couple of years ago. And I think this is the term. Do you see this red part? That's what we call sucks. That sucks. I mean, look at this. So there are a lot of people who go into engineering and science in, in the United States. It's a big country. But it started going down. So you know what happened around here? Do you know what happened around 1959? You can shout it out, but Sputnik. There was a space thing. And I grew up in the space race, and it was so cool. Everybody wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go to MIT. I showed up and I said, I want to be an astronaut. And they said, you're not good enough looking. You can be an engineer. <laughs> but then something, something happened. Stuff started happening here, and people stopped becoming, wanting to become engineers and scientists. And they wanted to become things like lawyers. Now, lawyers are fine. Lawyers are fine. <laughs> or, I mean, accountants. And they wanted to be accountants and things like that. The thing is, is that engineering is such a fun career, and it's about being creative. And I mean, like, if you're an accountant and you're creative, you, like, go to jail, you know? I went, so I was kind of, like, bummed at this. So I started to look into this. I was trying to figure out exactly what was going on behind it. So I looked up. I actually wrote a paper on this, and I did a bunch of, I looked at a bunch of technical studies. There was one study done by the largest engineering institution in our country. A national academy, and they surveyed 17,000 students about your age. 
and they said, what do you know about engineering, specifically about engineering? They came up with three messages. The three messages are, wait, engineering is hard. Okay, well, it kind of is hard, so that's not too bad. You must be good at math and science. Okay, that's also true. <laughs> and how about this one? It's not for everyone. So the three most, imp the things that when you ask any student in a high school in the United States what they knew about engineering, I mean, they came up with that. And this was like, you know, that's our brand. It was sort of like, eat it, it's good for you. You know, if you think about a doctor, what do you think about when you think about a doctor? You think about somebody with perfect hair, you know, he heals people, he or she heals people, and they drive a fancy car. I mean, this sucks. This is really bad. So it's even worse. It's even worse. This woman, uh, a friend of mine who is uh, the dean of engineering at Purdue, she actually tried to dig down in this. So she asked about 2,000 students about your age about engineering. And I promise, this is the last data chart. Okay? So, so she would say a question. She would say, like, ah, creates economic growth. And 69% of the students said, yeah, I think an engineer would create economic growth. Okay. Uh, make a strong leader. And so she kept asking these questions. Okay, 56% people said, hey, engineers, they're leaders. Okay, but check this out. Cares about the community, 37%. Sensitive to societal concerns. 28, improves quality of life, protects the environment, the most important issue in most people's minds, saves lives, 14%. I mean, this is almost like, you know, kills puppies or something like that. It's like, <laughs> what? I mean, if you, if you, this is not like just a bad brand. If you, if you were like sitting next to somebody like this on an airplane and you knew they were like this, you'd just kind of like, ugh. But the, the weird thing is, Miss Jameson, the, the dean, she asked people, she asked them about engineers, but then she asked about scientists, which is slightly different. And check this out. It seems to be in the wrist. So look at this. Oh, 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 scientists care about, they save lives, and scientists, and I thought this was really weird because it's sort of like people don't know what engineering is about. I mean, to me, you know, you know what an engineer is? A scientist with a job. I mean, it's, pretty, it's like, it's like, what's going on here? So, anyway. So, and, and this didn't help. I mean, you know, if you think about a nerd, look, I look like a nerd. And, you know, it didn't help that in TV and movies, there was always someone, I don't know what you have in Costa Rica, but we always had, you know, it, do you like have Big Bang Theory? And just like, you know, no wonder. You know, when I showed that statistic about engineers and, and, and then the, how the, the statistics were going down, it's even worse. If you look at women, or in my country, if you look at Latinos or, or African Americans or anything, it's even worse. So we're having so much trouble getting women or people of color to come in here. And I think this is a big part of this. You know, who wants to be like this? But it's getting better. It's getting better. Anyway, so... I, I was really troubled by this because I love it so much and I'd spent so much of my career trying to figure out, do you mind if I take this off? Hi. So I spent so much of my career trying to figure out how to make science and engineering more fun for people. It bugged me that there wasn't some better way of getting the message out. So one day, in, uh, it, I remember it was snowing, it was a couple of years ago, I went to my hippie wife, my beautiful hippie wife, and I said, Beautiful hippie wife, how can I get my message? You know, I had just made that stupid video I showed you, and I was like, how can I, how can I reach more kids and destroy more minds? You know, how can I get them? And she goes, don't ask me, I'm cooking. She said, go ask the cosmos. Go ask the universe. So I had my beer. Can I say beer? Beer's good, okay. So I, I walked outside, and I said, cosmos, what do you have for me? And nothing happened until the next morning. And then a weird thing happened. A lady called me out of the blue, and she called me and she said, do you want to be a scientist on reality TV? And I didn't hear the reality part, but I heard scientist TV. Hey, that'll work. Long story. So I, I basically called them, and they said, 
that they basically had found me on the internet and that I looked like the right person because I had weird hair. <laughs> Good enough credentials for science. So basically, I ended up, I made a little tape for them, I sent it to them, and they lost it. So I said, okay, that's not going to happen. They said, no, 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 send another one. So I sent another one, even less funny. And they said, a couple, a couple weeks later, I hadn't heard anything. They called me and they said, okay, can you be in Los Angeles? I live in Vermont, up here, in Los Angeles, uh, 5,000 kilometers away. They said, can you be in, in Los Angeles in two days? Just show up on the curb here and we'll tell you what to do. So I was so excited. Oh, I'm going to go try this out. I showed up and they told me the contact name. I was standing on the curb. He came out. I was like going to shake his hand. Instead, he put, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, yeah, he wrapped my eyes up, threw me in the car, and I'm like, oh, wow, what's this? So for three days, they made us, you know, take things apart. And there were about 20 of us. 2,000 people had applied for this thing, and I had no idea about it. But they made us take things apart, things back together, blow things up, and they made us take tests. I thought they were tests to see if we were, you know, good enough to be on TV. But they were really, it was about a reality TV show. They wanted to know that we were local, totally local. I mean, they were questions like, aliens control my thoughts? It's not so easy to answer, because if they did control your thoughts, they would tell you to say no. So I was like, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was a really interesting experience. It was really interesting. I thought, there's no way they want. As a matter of fact, I remember the psychologist who was reading my test looked at it, and he goes, are you sure you want to be on reality TV? And I was like, I had never seen, I have to tell you, I don't watch much TV, and I had never seen... Do you have bad reality shows here? Do you have reality shows like Survivor and Jersey Shore? I mean, I had never seen... <laughs> hey, let me tell you. I, I am the Jersey Shore. But, so anyway... Uh, um, I went home from this thinking, well, that was an interesting experience, because occasionally you just got to try stuff. I didn't hear anything. And then one day... I got a call from that same company and they said, hey, you're on the show, can you be out here in a week for two and a half months and you can't tell anybody where you're going? And I was like, I better talk to my boss. And it was the weirdest conversation. He said, you wanna do what? You're a senior guy at IBM, you wanna go be on a kid's show? You know, what, what the heck? It was great. So I ended up, you know, I said, what the heck, I'm gonna go do it. Because I thought, you know, being on a show like this would be about, I, I thought I would be sitting there every day and say, now look, children, this is how science works. It wasn't like that. But I ended up, you know, I kissed my wife, I kissed my dogs, not on the lips, and I got on the airplane, <laughs> same deal. They met us there, they put the bandanas on us, threw us in a bus, they, they kept us locked in a hotel room for a week and, and gave us all sorts of shots, tetanus shots and everything else, and then this is what happened. So basically, the, uh, the show was called The Colony, and I will say, it's on, it's on Discovery Channel, and the show sucks. It really is a stupid show, but it was so much fun. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go out and watch it, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it was like. The basic idea is one day, they pulled us out of our hotel rooms, they put a microphone on us, they took away our nerd clothes and gave us fake nerd clothes, and they basically told us, Go. They, they pointed at us at an old abandoned store and said, you know, go in there and see how long you can stay. And I was like, what? And we walked into this old store. It was covered with broken glass and stuff. And a couple of minutes later, real people with real baseball bats came in and started really hitting us. And I was like, oh. And this is sort of what it was like. So basically, we were to believe that there had been a terrible disaster like a biological disaster, a virus, and that almost everyone was dead. And this is what, what it looked like, I think. Is it going to work? No, you didn't hit that link, did you? No, no, no. Go back. Go back. You don't want to hit that link. Okay. You should just, we should just be able to go clink. No? Yeah. We are on the edge of a global catastrophic disaster. Human conflict. Nuclear bombs. Natural disasters. 
chemical and biological warfare. Without warning, the world as we know it can come to an end. Like what? It's a lot like work. So we lived there for, for uh, the 59 days. You have the YouTube your, your YouTube is playing as well. Stop the YouTube. Natural disasters, chemical and biological warfare. Without warning. Leave it there. Uh, whatever. Good help is so hard to find. <laughs> it's one of many no, cities I'm left sorry. devastated. Infrastructure breaks down. The chaos reigns. This is the setting of the colony. So the colony me? is a controlled experiment. They were throwing to see if pieces of tires at us. Built society in the wake of a global catastrophe. The backgrounds and expertise of these 10 volunteers represent a cross-section of modern society. For 10 weeks, they'll be isolated with no electricity from the grid, no running water, and no communication with the outside world. All they'll have to work with are their skills, the tools and supplies inside an abandoned factory, and whatever they can scavenge at a handful of cordoned off locations. As part of the experiment, an outside gang of looters and thugs will challenge the colonists' resources and security. The world of the colony has been designed using elements from both historical disasters and models of what the future would look like after a global viral outbreak. Throughout the series, a group of experts will put the colonists' challenges in the context of these real-world disasters. The volunteers of the colony have an amazing... So basically, that was all we knew. We didn't know what was really going on. So for 59 days, we stayed in this warehouse. We only went out once a week, and it was only when they could clear the streets out and so that these thugs could come and beat us up. But basically, it was 10 of us. So, um, let's see. And we're missing one guy here because he actually got kidnapped off the show. But we had Morgan, Allison, Mike. He was a, I don't know how the, the Spanish word, he was a jerk. How do you, yeah, he, you know, every, but he's a nice jerk. We're all good friends. Vlad, Amy, John, Lilani, um, Joey, but that's a secret. That's my wife and me. And then George, who was right here. I realized that I was in a really strange situation because one night, so we had never met each other. So we all showed up on the show and we're like, I was sitting there, you know, like 11 o'clock at night. We thought they couldn't hear us, but they could hear everything. They could even hear what we were thinking. And I said, how did you guys get off of your work to do this? Because I was only getting $7 an hour. $7 an hour, do you know how much that is? It's not very much. And they said, oh yeah, but it's 24 hours a day. I realized I was the only person who actually had a real job who was on the show, which was pretty weird. <laughs> but, but it was really fun. These are all really good friends of ours. So, and I realized I have to hurry up. This is where we lived. It's 615 Anderson. It's this huge old building. And basically, there was a small front yard full of junk cars and a small backyard, which is going to be important in a second. And we basically could do anything we wanted with this. And it was completely full of junk. So all of these things, that we had a big truck in here that we were rebuilding. This is where we had our fire for cooking. This is all inside, just gigantic. You know, um, this is like 20 meter ceilings. You know, just it used to be an old steel mill. And most recently, it had been uh, a place for, for crackheads to live in, which was kind of weird. But we slept back in here, we worked over here, and this is the only place where we could go outside. The neighborhood was really bad. They had to take the, the real bad guys out so they could put the fake bad guys in. And at night, you could hear gunshots and stuff like that. I remember at the end, there was a dog walking down this street, and we tried to get it to come over so we could eat it, but we couldn't. We ate a bunch of weird stuff. But you talk about challenges. It was a really interesting thing. Ten people who had never met each other, three toothbrushes. It's kind of weird. Okay. Um, two beds. Ten people, two beds, and no showers. That was something. But our bed was more fun than the other bed. I can tell you that. But it was, uh, we, had, we were sleeping on the floor. This is cardboard. These are uh, drapes, you know, for windows, etc. And... 
you know what? I never slept better because I was working so hard. Every night I slept great. We only had a little bit of power. We only had some car batteries that we could find. And it was, all, it was on Discovery Channel, which, so we were supposed to build stuff, but we didn't have much power. We didn't have much food. The food that we had was in, you know, we could find some cans. There were some bags of food where rats had gotten into them. We had to separate out the rat. Como se dice? Ah, si. No, the, 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 the rat, you know what, out of the food. We were eating really weird things. We had a lot of dog food and cat food. I ate a lot of dog food and cat food. But more on that in a second. But the real thing is, do you know how long you can go without eating? Three weeks. You know how long you can go without drinking water? About three days. And so they didn't really know what we were going to do. But the problem is, I remember day two, we were running out of water. We had found some water. We went up to the, ca the cameramen all over the place, and we said, hey, we're running out of water. And they went. So it was really about trying to figure out how to solve these problems, which is a lot like engineering. You know, you're really trying to solve problems with constraints. We ended up losing so much weight. I lost 12 pounds, which is what, five, six kilos, something like that, six kilos, something like that. Some people say I look better at the end, but, but two guys lost 30 pounds, 15, 15 kilos, something like that. And I was a vegetarian, you know that? You know what I mean is I didn't eat meat for 32 years. And my first meat, because I was getting so hungry, was rat. And we ate a lot of rat. Oh, it's so good. I, people say it tastes like chicken. I don't know. I haven't eaten chicken in so long. But one of these guys, Vlad, he was an engineer. Not the best engineer, but he was a great cook. And his rat with basil, it was very good. Now, the biggest challenge for me was these fake bad guys. So the 10 of us were really, you know, most of us were engineers or scientists or, or doctors or something like that. They picked a bunch of pretty, you know, trained people. But they had to make it seem like in, a, in, an, in an apocalypse, people would be coming in and trying to take our stuff. So they got these actors. This guy's name is Jared, and he's my Facebook friend. And about <laughs> five minutes after this, he went to the hospital because I accidentally stabbed him. And I'm not kidding. That's, but... These guys actually had to come in and make us so mad. They really had to punch us, hit us. The only rule they had is they couldn't kill us, which was good, and they couldn't hit us in the face. And anything else was OK. <laughs> and the good thing is, the rule was the same back. We couldn't kill them, and we couldn't hit them in the face, but anything else. So they kept trying to make us mad. And towards the end, they were more afraid of us than we were of them, because we were crazy. We were starved. They went home and slept in their beds. So that was really hard for me. But the main thing with challenge was, and this is, this is a lesson. You remember I said about picking up a, you know, why you should always carry a sheet of plastic? Well, we didn't have a lot of water. Water was really hard. The closest water was 800 meters away at the, at the river. And one time a week, we could go and carry the water, which is an interesting engineering problem. One kilo per liter. How many liters does a person need to sustain for a day? Yes, one and a half to two liters every day. So one day a week, we spent the whole day kind of going back and forth trying to get this green, black, smelling water back so that we could actually drink it. So, and then, then what did we have? So we had to filter it and everything like that and boil it. So there wasn't a lot of water for washing. So one day, about three days in, we, were, we stunk so bad because we'd been in the river and we'd been sleeping in the same bed and it was about 35 degrees and we were just like, and it started raining. And so my nine colleagues, they went out to the front door with every bowl and everything to grab whatever water they could. I ran out the back door, and I threw off my microphone. I took off my clothes and just stood there and felt the dirt coming off of myself. And I turned around, and there was a $100,000 camera looking at me. And I said, dude, you, you wouldn't do that. He goes, I, I'd pick up that sheet. So long story is... I had never, I didn't even think about this. I didn't even think about this. So when I actually, you know, so I went home after the filming, and I hadn't seen the show, and the show was about to come on, and they invited me out to L.A., my wife and I, to go see the show, to, you know, for the first time with all of our friends and everything. It was going to be so exciting. And right before we went, I got a call from the New York Times, biggest newspaper in the United States. And I started telling him about how engineering careers were going down and how we had to make engineering more fun. And he goes, hey, 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 I, I don't want to hear that. 
I said, well, what do you want to hear about? He goes, I want to hear about the last 45 seconds of the first show. And I said, well, I haven't seen it. So there I was, standing in front of a, a room twice as big as this. And this is after I picked up the sheet. It was pretty bad. So there I was, completely naked, pixelated, and I'm going, my parents are seeing this. <laughs> my kids, my dogs are seeing this. My boss, as a matter of fact, the, the senior vice president in charge of communications for IBM saw this, and the only thing he said to me the next time he said it, he said, you should get more sun. <laughs> My point is that sometimes, you know, you think you're an engineer, you're a student, and you go, oh, if I don't get this test right, I won't get the right score, and I won't get into the right college, and then I won't marry the right boy or girl, and then I won't get the right job, I'll end up living in a ditch. You know what? It's never as bad as you think. My career has only gotten better since this, so don't worry about it so much, is all I'm trying to say. And always carry a sheet of plastic. So basically, though, for all of those challenges, the, um, the main thing we did was build stuff. So the, you know, at the first, it was a little hard to get used to all these crazy things, beating us up and stuff. But most of the time, you can sort of see in this that there's just big racks of junk, and we had to put it all up in there, but it was just full of burning, burned out junk and people's basements and stuff. Most of the time, we spent practicing engineering, making stuff. Here I am working on a, a shock probe so that I could scare away those guys with a big spark. I mean, how much fun is that? Working all day on creating cool new stuff. So what we did is we created a whole bunch of stuff. The first, pro and, and we had to handle them in, in, in the sort of order of importance. Like I mentioned, water. The water that we got from the river was black and green and smelled like poop. <laughs> so we had to figure out how to, walk to clean it. So I made a, a, a filter out of sand and rocks, and the sand takes the particles out, and the charcoal, I'm sorry, charcoal took most of the smell out, and then we had to boil it. But that, that, was, that was our first build. So we, had, we ended up having to keep track of how much water we had. And when we got down there, that's when we started to ration. Then we had to figure out how to generate electricity. We had a lot of car batteries, but no gener you know, nothing to generate power with. We had, you know, every car has an alternator, which is basically a generator in it. But, and we had some gasoline engines, but what didn't we have? No gas. So we had no gas. So how would you run a gasoline engine to run a generator if you didn't have gas? Well, it turned out that I used to be, when I was at, uh, in college, I lived in Austria. And one night, after too much schnapps and, and language that I didn't know very well, an old lady told me that they used to run their cars on wood. And all they would do is they would take wood scraps and they would put it in a container. They'd build a fire under that container and they'd take the fumes that came out of the wood. They wouldn't let them burn and they would put it right into the engine. So I said, let's try that. And actually, believe it or not, it actually worked. We took a, a, a gasoline motor from a lawnmower, we took the alternator from a car, and we took the smoke from this giant container of wood that we built a fire under it, and it actually worked. And it was so cool because when the show was on, we could see all of these kids out there trying it. For all I know, they blew their houses up, but it was so, so much fun. Eventually, they got tired of watching us chop up wood so they said, hey, they call me professor. They said, hey, professor. And by the way, I, I'm using I, 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 but I didn't all, do all of this by myself by any chance. There were 10 of us. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But they said, hey, we're tired of watching you cut up wood. Why don't you make something, you know, for another source of power? And I said, what, you want me to build a nuclear reactor? And they said, no, how about solar? And I was like, who's going to believe that? You know, on a TV show, we found solar. And the guy took me up on the roof, and he pointed at the buildings. In, we were in L.A., and, you know, maybe every 10th building had solar panels on the top. And he said, pick a building. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, so we pointed at a building nearby. And he let, he organized, he, he called these guys, and he had a ton of money. And he, it, they made it possible for us to go and break in. Like, we got to smash the windows and actually climb up there and steal these things. It was so much fun. And then... And then Morgan and I actually went out and we, we built a, a little solar tracker. You can sort of see it there. Do you know like when you go into the, uh, the bathroom and it turns the lights off or, or on? You know, if you turn the lights off, the little nightlight goes on. So we basically used one of those and made a little, a little um, thing 
thing that just kind of followed along with you, and when it would hit the sun, it would stop. And basically, Michael and Joey had made this frame that it would, it would go like that until it would stop, and then as the sun moved, it would go you know, a little bit more. Now, if a cloud came over, the whole thing would go all the way to the end, then it would come back and find the sun, then the sun would move there, and it would go back and forth. It was crazy, but it really worked. It was really fun. And they would finally, they wouldn't tell us what to do. They, the whole idea, we didn't have the internet or anything like that. But they, they kept, you know, sort of telling us, well, here's where the story should go. Now, they wouldn't tell us what to do. And if we made a mistake, they would show that we made a mistake. Because engineering is actually about, try, you know, all things in science. You try things, and some they work, and some that they don't. But they asked me if I could build a radio. I was like, hmm. And actually, I was able to remember, I, I do a lot of high voltage. Do you know what a Tesla coil is? Have you ever heard of a Tesla coil? So basically, I was able to make a radio, sort of like was on the Titanic. It was a, called a spark gap transmitter. And I used the high voltage thing from a car, the ignition, uh, the electronic ignition circuit. And we made a capacitor out of window and aluminum foil. And basically, we were able to make this kind of cool little radio and I knew it, you know, we had some AM radios from cars, so we could see that it worked. But the way I really knew it worked is that, you know, all of the cameramen had these kind of crazy little earphones in there so they could talk to each other. And whenever I would turn this thing on, they would go, bah! So it was mostly about building cool stuff. So, um, and we made like an electronic car. We, you know, we found a big old motor because trying to go get water, it was so heavy. Okay? Okay, boy. So we, had to, we found this old motor. We made, I made a speed controller. These are all of our car batteries. We put solar to trickle charge it. And we were able to make this little car that we could get the 800 meters and we could carry a lot more water back. Unfortunately, right after we built it, Mike, Michael, the, what did I say? Jerk, jerk guy. He was a nice jerk. But one day, he decided he was going to ride it around inside the building at night and he missed a turn, and the whole thing turned over on him. There was battery acid on the ground. There was glowing metal because it had shorted out the batteries. There was blood everywhere, and it was just like so cool. <laughs> but I, next day, I found a half a centimeter piece of his scalp on my desk. But they, they took him to the hospital, and they sewed him up. We had three hospitalizations. I told you about uh, that guy, Jared, who I accidentally stabbed. Uh, uh, Michael, when he turned this thing over on himself, and it weighed 1,600 pounds. He was pretty lucky. But the other thing, Joey, who was uh, um, our carpenter guy, he had a kidney stone. You know what that is? So he went to the hospital, and they, took, they, they actually took the camera with him, like real reality show. And they gave him just a couple of seconds to like put on the stupid little thing that shows your butt. You know, you know they put the thing. So they, so they give him a few moments alone. And he's, so he's alone in the hospital. And he, he just grabbed anything he could because we needed food. We needed medicine. So he came back and he goes, hey, he showed us their backpack. Look what I got. 23 pregnancy tests. <laughs> up with a solution. I wandered oh. into a conversation as I was kind of in one of those, you know, thoughtful moments, like, what could I do? I walked over there. Amy and Lalani were talking about water purification. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about one thing, and she starts asking me about how do we purify water? Could we use the solar, et cetera? And all of a sudden, this giant kind of, you know, light bulb moment happens. I can make ozone. And ozone is the, Look how is dirty the chemical am. that many water, many municipalities use to like purify their water. Ozone is a highly reactive, unstable form of oxygen that can be used to kill bacteria. And I got to go home and sleep water. in a real Ozone bed. molecules can form in several different ways, one of which is when high voltage electrical discharge passes through the air, like lightning. <laughs> oh, no. And it's the smell you get after a lightning storm. You walk outside in that great fresh smell. Well, a little of it makes it smell fresh. A and lot of it. I'll spare you the rest of that. Anyway, we built a lot of fun stuff. But the, the main thing that I wanted to tell you about, I wanted to tell you 10 lessons that I came. And I have to do them really quick. But I actually, you know, this was about trying to share my passion with stuff, uh, with, with, about science and engineering. One thing I learned is how important it is to work with other people. And I don't mean like, you know, teams are, you know, we're not, none of us is as good as all of us. But I was going to try to turn this whole 
car over to get to that transformer, to the high voltage transformer, and Michael came over and said, Professor, you beep, beep, beep. You know, <clears throat> that's going to take you all day. So he called everybody, and we just took the car and went, Thoop. And one of the things that I realized is that sometimes we think it's a weakness if we ask for help. And actually what I learned from doing this show is it's, it's stupid not to ask for help. Because, you know, we were so concerned about trying to do it, you know, make this is my project and, you know, nobody's going to help me or I would appear weak if I asked for help. I found how important it was to actually go ask for people. I also found out that, you know, life, you usually don't have as, as much stuff as you need to actually get everything done. So I found it was really fun. You know, the first couple of weeks we were like, oh, I don't have all the parts I need to build electronics. Oh, I don't have all the wood. I don't have all the, you know, the metal or I don't have all the tools. We ended up having a whole lot of fun just trying to do things with, with just the constraints that we had. Selena, I think that I'm gonna skip through some of these and just, you think? So I'm gonna, yeah. Oh, yelling sucks, I learned that. I learned that on reality show. As a matter of fact, there was one point where we were trying so hard to get everything done and I told everybody, okay, everybody, can't we all get along? And the guy came out and said, if we wanted people to get along, we would have hired beeping robots. He said, don't get along. But it really was hard to keep things working when people were yelling. Another thing I found is that what people know about themselves, what they say about themselves, like I was supposed to be a computer engineer and, you know, Michael, the jerk, was supposed to be a solar technology guy. But what actually we found is that everybody's got secret powers. So when you're working with a team, sometimes, you know, like, for example, Michael, he was so big and scary that we would stick him outside when the bad guys came. And they would either, he would either scare them away or they would eat him. And either way, we'd be up. Or like Vladimir, I told you, he was a mechanical engineer, but he was a much better cook than a mechanical engineer. And I was... Uh, you know, and like uh, Amy was a marine biologist. You know, if you're locked in a warehouse, the best thing to do with a marine biologist is eat her. But, but she was really good at writing things down. So she, she, you know, she all had, you know, everybody had some secret powers. Like Joey, he had been in prison for six years for smuggling cocaine. So he was really good at security and he could make alcohol out of anything. <laughs> and I was... I was the computer engineer, but mostly I was just the weird old guy, and they would come and tell me their problems, and I'd be half listening, and, they, and then I'd go, oh, and they would say, ah, yeah, yeah. So basically, you don't know what people are good at until you actually learn. So don't necessarily look at their badge or their business card. Another thing I learned, I told you about the rats, if you see food, eat it. And I mean that really, because like we would save our peanut butter. Peanut butter was like, the, you know, we could buy it from these fake traders, but the, the bad guys would try to steal it. So don't put off having fun is what it really means. Is that if, you know, you've got to study tonight, but there's a concert, you know what? Go to the concert. Don't put off having fun. That's, a, that's an old guy speaking. Just make sure. No matter what adults tell you otherwise. And also, lesson 5A, is anything is food if it's properly prepared. So we had a lot of, we had a lot of, uh, Rat, pigeon, goat, and that dog was looking really good. But <laughs> Lesson six, whatever you do, if you're a technologist or you're an artist or whatever, write things down. Sometimes we always forget to document what we do. It was really good. Morgan made a wall-sized mural of everything, and it was so handy. We also wrote down, uh, Amy wrote down in, every, in her journals everything we built, which was really important because we've been able to publish some stuff about people... Millions of people saw this show, and it's on Netflix now, and people continue to ask us. So now we have write-ups on how all the builds work, and everything that we showed that worked really worked. So document your work. Lesson seven, no matter how bad things get, no matter, you know, you may be in the end of final exams, don't forget to have fun. Sometimes it's so, it's, you know, sometimes pressure gets so hard, you just say, I can't go have fun. But it turns out, and you can read this, and any, we, we made a record player. Morgan and I made a record player because we missed music so much, and we found some old records, and we used a needle to kind of make it. And they said, nobody wants, to, the, the producer said, nobody wants to see you guys having fun. But it turns out that if, if you're under stress and you forget to have fun, your creativity goes down. So no matter what you're doing, college exams, et cetera, you've got to remember to continue to have fun. Lesson eight, expect the unexpected. Well, the weird thing is, 
eight weeks into a 10 week thing, I'm working on this transmitter and it's just not working. And I just, it was Easter. I later found out it was Easter. And I said, I'm not gonna get distracted by anything. I'm gonna keep working. And I'm working, working, working. And then all of a sudden, Lalani says, John Cone, your wife is here. And I was like, what? My wife? My, actually, my first reaction was, how do you know my last name? So I ran up and I could look out on the street and they had all these fake bad guys and fake uh, uh, beggars there. And there was my real wife from 500 kilom 5,000 kilometers away. And all the cameras are on me and I'm going, they're like, what's he gonna say? And I said, who has the dogs? <laughs> but it turns out that right after I left home, they, they called three different people to see if their wives or girlfriends could come on the show as kind of a surprise. And Diane was the only one who could pass the drug test. But it was so much fun having her there for the last two weeks because she's an engineer. And, she would, and not only that, she smelled good. So that was really good. So, but my point is, is this, this took 30 minutes out of my day and it made it really hard to finish that project. So my basic point is, don't leave everything to the last minute because your wife may show up. <laughs> Lesson nine, and this is a sad one. This is a pretty hard thing to hear. But Diane and I have three beautiful kids and our middle kid, Sam, died about seven years ago, just in a traffic accident. And he was an organ donor. And so one of the things, that's why it's so important for me to work with kids, because I, I, it's one way that I kind of like heal. And we make these rocks called Samstones, if you look at samstones.org, that talk about Sam and talk about organ donation. When we were going into the colony, we weren't allowed to bring anything, because they didn't want us to you know, fake anything. But I had six of these, and I was not going on there without them. And they, they weren't gonna let me on there, and I said, I'm not, I'm not going on there without these. So they let me take these in. And when I was building the water, the water purification thing, I put one of those sandstones in the water. And I'm, you know, it, it's hard to believe, but about two or three days into it, you didn't care that there were cameras there. You know, we were all working on stuff. We were working pretty hard. And I was telling my friends about you know, the sandstone story, et cetera. Well, that worked into the first show on Discovery Channel. About three and a half weeks later, I get a call from a guy. He was a kidney kidney recipient, the organ recipient from my son, and it, my son's kidney had saved his life. And two years ago, Diane and I went to his wedding. And it was the weirdest thing, because I think about, you know, of all the things that happened from this show, I've heard from thousands of people about engineering and science. That might have been the only reason I was really supposed to do it, because it allowed me to say something that was really important on a really, you know, on a big stage. So don't un underestimate the impact of things that you do. You never know what's going to be important in your life. And finally, and I'm done, okay, okay. Finally, whatever you are passionate about, you may not be a nerd, you may not be an engineering or science person, you know, you may like literature or music or whatever, but whatever you do, figure out a way of passing that passion on, because that's what's so important. That's why I like doing this passion about science. Um, this is, I found out that my real passion was making weapons that didn't kill people, but scared them. Now, across the main warehouse, John C. does some inventory before planning his first weapons build. I How want a couple of big projects that I need to own that actually work to my own specialty, my, my love of science. And I was dreaming about a flamethrower idea that I'm hoping to build. If you were to light something at the end of a piece of propane, you'd get, you could get a pretty pretty good feather, but it won't go very far. Right. This will give a big puff of flame. John's going to build a propane-fueled flamethrower with the help of a solenoid valve he found in the warehouse. There were some pretty lucky finds. Solenoid valve, admit. electromechanical switch. They made it pretty easy rapidly on it. When charged with an electric current. Hook up this barrel. You want it long enough, you're able to jam it through a window. We'll have a handle here with a trigger. The business end of so it said, please like don't that. try this at home. And Do you know how many kids kind of actually did try it at home? Move it around and hopefully fire it over the marauders' heads, and if they don't back off, you fire it at them. Okay, watch out. It, it is What's so funny. cool is With the first the design the never worked, and they showed that it didn't work. The flamethrower. I didn't have enough battery to open up the valve. You don't have enough your battery to open up the valve. Take the one out of the truck. It, sh it should be good. Next, John C. demonstrates the flamethrower for security foreman Joey.
two points for right. best. So I couldn't bring a flamethrower on the airplane, but they, we just improvised one. Do you know pep, pepinillos? Okay, so we have pepinillos, two tenadores, and a thing. Let's see if this will work. Can we turn the lights off? Oh, wait. Bueno. Ah! Mira! Okay, so it's not a flamethrower. But it's improvising with what you can find on the way between here and the airport. So anyway, the big thing I would say is whatever your passion is, let's just leave that on for a second. Whatever your passion is, find a way. Oh, man, that stinks. Oh, I want the last, last slide. Is at the end, it was so hard for me to leave. They had to drag me out. I, now I would unplug it. It's dangerous. <laughs> I went home to the, to the hotel, and Diane was there. I took a, sh a bath. I was so dirty. And then I let the water out, and I said, oh, you know, I should take a, I, I, I should take a picture. But I had, you know, we had already washed the bath about. So I took a second bath. This is after second bath. Anyway, that's basically, you know, sometimes you just got to do something crazy. And whatever it is that you're passionate about, find some way of keeping that passion alive and sharing it with people. So anyway, thank you very much. Sorry to keep you so late. Bye. Oh, questions. Okay.